Good morning, everybody. Um, I would like to begin by thanking the Santa Kabir School and the Seagull Foundation for this invitation to come and speak here this morning. Um, for someone who has, uh, who is a Punjabi but has lived most of her life outside, it's always a pleasure to come back and it's always a pleasure to come back and uh, connect once again with one's roots. All right. um, I decided to speak on a subject that we generally dismiss by cliches. Uh, what is meant by a region? What is meant by religion? Uh, we don't really like to go into the details, the nitty gritty of examining these concepts. And so I thought that maybe I would take up the case of how I look at region and religion in the Punjab. And I'm going to stay completely within my own jurisdiction, which is pre-modern history. I am not coming to the modern period. It's too complicated. Uh, and so forgive me if I stay in the past, but as it was said earlier this morning, the past is very, very central to understanding the present. There have been philosophers, for example, the Buddha, who more or less argued that there is virtually no present because as one speaks, the present is already becoming the past. So the past is very crucial. Okay, let me start. Um, in 1849, as many of you would probably know, Ganesh Das, a Punjabi Khatri Kanungo of the administration, wrote a book in Persian which was entitled Char Baghe Punjab, describing what constituted the Punjab. It was written at a time when the East India Company had just taken over the Sikh kingdom of the Punjab and established itself in this region. He described the Punjab as a compact region uh, bounded by the Indus to the north and the Satlij to the south. Very nice, neat geographical distribution. And he went on to say that it is a region in which three religions prevail, the Hindu, the Muslim, and the Sikh. And I would like to go into this question of, is the Punjab, does it consist of just these areas? And are these the three religions that have always prevailed in the Punjab? Or is the picture slightly different? Um, I see the Punjab as a geographically well-defined unit, but with clear sub-regions. If you look at the map, you can see quite clearly what he means when he talks about the Indus to the north, turning, doing a U-turn, as it were, coming down to the Satlij in the south with a little overlap south of the, the Satlij, almost, well, touching, in fact, the, the watershed area, as it is called, before you get to the Ganga Yamuna Doab. And the rivers flowing up into the mountains, cutting valleys into the lower hills, but continuing right up to um, the upper hills. So I see the Punjab as consisting of, first of all, two sets of regions, that is the lowland, the five doabs, each divided by the flow of the river. And of course, as you all know, they each have a separate name. And the upland, which goes along the foothills, the submontane area of the lower Himalayas, reaching out a little bit into the plateau, the slightly brownish region between the Jhelum and the Indus, the Potohar Plateau which is sometimes connected with the uplands and sometimes not. These two regions are morphologically and ecologically quite distinct. And this is an important thing to keep in mind. 
The lowlands, as we call them, the Doab areas, are largely scrub and desert, with some agriculture in the floodplains. The Sindh Sagar Doab, between the Jhelum and the Indus, for example, south of the plateau, is a very typical example of the kind of ecology that you get in this region. And up to the, about the 16th century, this was largely an area occupied by agro-pastoralists, where pastoralism was a very important uh, occupation. Uh, the, the Doabs, after this initial fertility, suffered a desiccation in Harappan times or the late Harappan times. And what is interesting, of course, about the Doabs is that the region was never the nucleus of a powerful kingdom. It was always divided up into small kingdoms and small chiefships. The Ganarajas and the Ganasabhas, assemblies of people, were chiefships, and there were these small kingdoms. You never had a really powerful kingdom that controlled the whole of the Punjab and beyond um, as powerful kingdoms are described. It was always sometimes a part of another kingdom, perhaps coming up from the Ganges Valley, but not quite making it into the Punjab, or more often part of the kingdom on the borderlands, that is the, from our point of view, the trans-Indus region uh, going north into the Bactria and, and the, the Bactrian region of the Oxus River. The southern Doabs, that is uh, the Sutlej, the Ravi, the Bias, the southern Doabs, what is sometimes called also the Panchanad, the region where the confluence meets the Indus around the big city there was Multan. Um, these are pastoral until about the 14th century when canals are constructed by Ferocia Tughlaq and a certain amount of agriculture comes in. But very importantly, do keep in mind that there are two major routes that cut through the Punjab. One is the northern route that goes along the foothills, what used to be called the Mauryan Highway, uh, starting in Taxila and moving down along the foothills to the watershed and further into the Ganga Valley. And the southern route that comes across the Bolan Pass, just south of the Sutlej, and then cuts across to Delhi, which was also used, as I shall explain. So much for the lowlands. The uplands consist of these two areas, the predominant area, which is the upper reaches of the five rivers, all reaching into the lower Himalayas, uh, pastoral in the higher valleys, agricultural in the lower valleys, linked to the foothills through the rivers that cut into the mountains, uh, creating what I like to call gateway valleys. These are gateways into the mountains and gateways from the mountains coming down into the plains. And on the other side of the Indus, as I said, that slightly brownish area between the Jhelum and the Indus is the Potohar Plateau, uh, which is not very high, the southern end of which has the salt range. And this whole area is heavily dependent upon and draws on this highway that goes from the Khyber to uh, the Delhi Plain. Uh, that's one area. The plateau itself is important at certain periods, not always, but at certain periods, and uh, is adjacent to the highway, and in a sense, its importance is also dependent on, on the highway. Now, so much for the um, general geographical, geomorphological background. I'm sorry, this is a very sketchy thing. Could I have the other map, please? I, I'm sorry, um, this is a ghastly map which I made in a hurry just before leaving for Chandigarh. Uh, but it'll give you a rough idea of what I'm talking about. Let's turn now to look at the religion and see how the religion relates to the regions. 
Uh, we begin with the Harappan culture, the cities of Harappa, Ganveriwala, Ropar, and so on, all following in the southern reaches of the Ravi, following the Sutlej, the famous Cholistan area, which is just south of the Sutlej, moving in towards the watershed. And this is where you have this major problem of the Sutlej, which is constantly changing course. And this creates a great problem for archaeology, because sometimes you have settlements on the edge of the river, and sometimes you have them right in the riverbed. And you have them in the riverbed because the river has changed course. Um, so that kind of um, hydraulic change that goes on in some of the rivers is, is a problem. Um, we don't know too much about the Harappan religion because we're guessing from the objects that have been found and only when the uh, pictograms will be deciphered will we really have any firm idea. But we do start getting certain important clues to religion with the Rig Veda, which is about 1200 BC. Much more certainty, it's a text it describes what the religion is. Um, it covers the Northwest and Punjab. All the Doabs are active, and they're all active with agro-pastoralism. Please remember that one of the problems we have is though the Harappans had agriculture and access to agriculture, when you come to the Rig Veda, there seems to be very little agriculture. Why is this? Where has the water disappeared? is a big question. Um, there's a faint suggestion that there was a migration eastwards because in the post-Rigvedic period or the end of the, the, the latter part of the Rigvedic period, all the compositions of what we call the later Vedic texts, uh, the Brahmanas, the Aranyakas, the Upanishads and so on, even the Vedas themselves, um, are all outside of the Punjab. They're all composed in areas to the east and the southeast. So was there a migration? If there was a migration, why was there a migration? I'm not talking about a massive migration, but a tendency for people to move away from one area and go into the other. The Mahabharata and the Ramayana mention a few names. The Ambashthas, who are at the confluence around in the Multan area, uh, the Kekeyas, as we know, and the Madras, which are upstream in the upper Doabs. They seem to be treated as frontier people because um, there's not a very sort of comfortable description. Even if the Kekeyas in the Ramayana, if you go through it carefully, it's not as if these are people that we are completely at home with from the point of view of the Middle Ganges Valley. There's a certain distance. And the Madras are distinctly different. Uh, one of the things that they keep complaining about is that their women are so liberated. And I find this very comforting to know that there was a time when Punjabi women were really liberated and did exactly what they wanted to do, which is very nice. Um, but what happens, this is, this is now the, the, the first millennium BC that I'm talking about. But in the middle of this first millennium BC, there is a major historical change in religion. It's a change that hasn't been fully recognized. It's been glossed over because we've all been brought up on the mytho mythology that religions are monolithic and they're inclusive and everything comes under the label of that particular religion. Um, so when the, the, the history of Hinduism was being written, it was just felt that it was a continuous history from the Vedic period onwards. And so on. But in fact, in the middle of the first millennium, around the time when the cities of the middle Ganges, the Maghada region and places like that, the cities were beginning to develop, uh, you get a departure, which is that of the religions of Buddhism, Jainism, the Ajivakas, the theories of the Charvak, the Lokayat, as they're sometimes called, which come under a sort of general label that is the label of Shramanism. 
the Shravan, of course, was... So um, one of the things that you have to keep in mind is that... Oh, we've lost the map. Uh, anyway, the region of the Indus is, in fact, a region um, where there is a continual movement from powers on the other side of the Indus coming across, conquering a bit of that upper Doab, or people from the Doab going across the Indus and conquering a bit on the other side that we call the borderlands. This is the area between Punjab and Afghanistan, the borderlands, and a little to the north of that is the um, the, the Iranian Hakamini dynasty, for example, claims that it controlled Gandhar and Hindu. Yeah, the Iranian dynasty claims that it had control over Gandhar, which is the northern part of the Punjab, the area that crosses over from the Indus into the northernmost part of the Doabs. Um, and this claim continues until the Mauryan period. The post-Mauryan, I'm going to jump a little bit because we've lost time. The post-Mauryan period, Gupta period, uh, is a period in which there is still some continuation of the earlier religious map. Now, what had happened in the Mauryan and post-Mauryan period is that there was a huge spread of Buddhism in the Punjab. Buddhism uh, across the Doabs, the northern Doabs, only in the lowlands, into the region of Gandhar, which is the region of Taxila, Peshawar, Rawalpindi, the northern edge of the Doabs. Um, and a little bit along that highway that I was talking about, the Mauryan Highway in the foothills, on, in, the, in the plains, in the shadow of the foothills. And Buddhism was very prevalent at that time. The patronage came from the Kushans, the Shakas, the Parthians, um, all those rulers of the borderlands and of the Northwest. What happens in the post-Gupta period is that Buddhism undergoes a um, I was saying that in, in the period from the Mauryas to the Guptas, there was the spread of Buddhism on a very large scale. Um, if you imagine the map again, there's one huge nodal area which is called Gandhar, uh, which is, uh, of which Taxila is a major city on this side of the Indus, and the spread of Buddhism takes place there. And the other nodal area where there is a lot of Buddhism and Jainism and um, elements of what we call the Puranic religion, Puranic Hinduism, that is the worship of Shiva and, and Vishnu, um, is around Mathura. So in a sense, what you get is that Punjab is bookended between Buddhism and Gandhar and Buddhism and Jainism and other religions in Mathura. There isn't too much activity, but there is some activity in the Punjab itself uh, supporting the Buddhists. But in the post-Gupta period, there is a surprising change, surprising because one didn't expect it from the degree to which Buddhism was being patronized earlier, uh, where gradually there is a decline of Buddhism. Uh, how do we assess this? Um, there is, for example, uh, in, along the, the um, um, main highway, there are still sites, Buddhist sites. Um, for example, we have one nearby, Sangrol and other Buddhist sites. But interestingly, for example, at this site, the uh, railings were, for some reason, taken down, packed, and buried underground. And it's a question that has to be answered. Why did they do this? Why did they, in a sense, dismantle the stupa and bury parts of it in the ground? Was there a threat? That's one question. 
The other interesting thing is that on the Potuhar Plateau, for example, there are quite a few Shaiva temples, small temples, nothing grandiose and magnificent, built on the foundations of Buddhist structures. And again, one has to ask the question, what happened to the Buddhist structures that, in fact, they ended up by becoming the foundations and the base for Shaiva temples? And the third bit of evidence that we have about uh, the attack on Buddhism comes from uh, the Kalhana Raj Tarangani, where Kalhana repeatedly says, twice or thrice in some length, that uh, in this period, in the post Gupta period, when the Hunas, the Huns, were predominant in this area of Kashmir and Gandhar, that there was an attack on Buddhist monasteries and the killing of Buddhist monks by the followers of Shaivism. Um, and we know from other places too in the country that this was a point where, in which Buddhism is very much on, on the decline. The Guptas obviously did not share the Mauryan enth enthusiasm for the Shramana religions. Uh, but it's not just royalty that matters. Royalty matters up to a point in the sense that they do provide some of the more dramatic patronage. But what is much more important is that the general public, the general public, for example, um, or other people like wealthy merchants and wealthy landowners, which religion are they patronizing? And there is a gradual decline in the patronage to Buddhism. Uh, one could go into the much bigger question of was it something about the Buddhist teaching that led to this or was it uh, something else that was involved? What is interesting in the pre-Gupta period is that you don't get what one expects that with the coming of the Indo-Greeks and the Shakas and the Kushans, that the uh, population of the Punjab would convert to another religion. On the contrary, what you get is inscriptions, occasional inscriptions, not very many, but some, of Yavanas, people who refer to themselves, themselves as Yavanas, which is anybody coming from the West, uh, but in this case, more likely the Greeks, some of them convert to Buddhism in the sense, convert in the sense that they start following Buddhist teaching and making donations to Buddhist centers. So it's a kind of interesting intermixture where you have a supposedly people coming from outside who are picking up and following the prevalent religion in the country where they come and work and settle uh, where they come and live. Now, the, this is roughly the picture, I'm so, sorry it's <laughs> very rough altogether, but this is roughly the picture as it exists in the first millennium. Um, and in the second millennium, the picture changes. And the question has to be asked as to why it changes. Let me begin by taking you to the uplands first, these uh, hill states, hill kingdoms uh, in the Punjab, foothills in the sub-montane regions uh, moving up into the lower Himalayas. There was a limited migration from the plains going up to the hill states in the late first millennium. As we know from the number of small temples and shrines that occur in the valleys that are cutting through the mountains leading to the uplands. And then you get the emergence in the second millennium at various periods of time of the much more established kingly states, what, when, what are sometimes referred to as uh, by, by colonial writing as the Punjab hill states. Places, uh, kingdoms like Chamba, Kangra, Mandi, Kullu, and so on, a whole lot of others. Now these states, unlike the kingdoms of the lower, of the lowlands, of the Doabs, boast rather massive temples, very impressive temples, like the one 
at Masroor and the one in Bajnath and the complex of temples in Jogeshwar, places like that. It's a mixture of Shaiva and Vaishnava temples. And what is very striking is that these hill states, the temples seem to have links with um, the Ganga plain. <laughs> this is marvelous. <laughs> Never spoken with a musical accompaniment before. Uh, I'd like. <laughs> I'd, I'd like to take the example of Chamba and discuss that in a little more detail. The Chamba Vamshavali narrates the story of the kingdom and it begins with the arrival, interesting, of a large body of Siddhas. These are ascetics and people who generally belong to the Shaiva tradition. They turn up in Chamba and the Vamshavali says that miraculously thousands of Shivalingams sprouted out of the earth and everybody started worshipping them. Um, then there is a kind of pause. The, the really important change that takes place in, these, in Chamba is around the 10th century, 9th, 10th century, when you get small temples being built in an upland area called Brahmor. And these are all temples, again, in the Puranic Hindu tradition. And then in the 12th century, the dynasty decides to move down to a lower elevation, the, the Chamba Plain, and they construct the city of Chamba as the capital of the kingdom. They also do another very interesting thing, which is that they import, literally, they invite Brahmins from the Ganga Plain to come and settle in Chamba. And this is when you get the very substantial spread of what might be called Puranic Hinduism, as many people in the history of religion are using this term. Now, um, the region plays a very central role in defining the kind of Puranic Hinduism. Shaivism, Vaishnavism, Shakta, and Tantric worship. All of this comes in at this time. Uh, the Brahmins are settled and are given grants of land, which are recorded in inscriptions. All over Jamba, you find these inscriptions. Practically every valley that is cultivable has grants of land and has temples. This is in great contrast to the lowlands where we do not find these grants of land. And in other parts of the subcontinent, there are massive, multiple numbers of grants of land to Brahmins wherever it is possible to cultivate land. And these become grants to temples and grants to Brahmins and so on. So that the land grants are very important in marking the presence of the Brahman in marking a substantial change to a system of making grants of land. And the whole debate that has gone on about does this constitute feudalism or not, which is a very significant debate, uh, takes place over these grants substantially. But it is a major uh, change, historical change in the region, which occurs in the uplands, but is relatively absent in the lowlands. And this is an interesting question as to why this happens. Why were the Brahmins so important? Yes, for religion, for ritual. Ritual is important if you're trying to establish your status. And one of the ways you do it is by getting someone who is respected as holy, sacred, all the rest of it, who comes along and says, yes, this person is of very high status. And in the case of royalty, provides them with a lineage. Now that lineage connection is very, very crucial. And we find that after the 12th century and after the Brahmins have moved into Chamba, the inscriptions start referring to the Varman dynasty as Surya Vamsha Kshatriyas. 
Now, this is one of the labels that has always given the Kshatriyas, the, the major Kshatriyas, the important ones, uh, like to regard themselves as being either Chandravamsh or Suryavamsh, the lunar lineage or the solar lineage. Till you get to the Rajputs who invent another lineage for themselves, which is that of the Agni Kula, the Rajputs that sprang out of the sacrificial fire. But anyway, in Chamba, it is the Suryavamsh uh, Kshatriyas. Um, as a statement of power, as well as a statement of religion, and the two things very often go together. This is a question a historian always has to ask. They start building temples, and so in Chamba you get the building of the famous Lakshmi Narayan temple complex, which is a very large dominant complex in, in the valley. Um, and the maintenance of the temple is again through grants of land to the temple, and grants of land to the Brahmins who are actually administering um, the functioning of the temple. The grants are very, very crucial. So in the uplands, in these hill kingdoms, you have Brahmins who had landed property, status, and authority. And consequently, they are the dominant caste in these regions. Um, one has to then ask the question all along, is this the merging of politics and religion? Something which has continued to this day. But anyway, it was expressed differently in earlier times. The Brahmanical presence in the uplands and the lowlands differs. As a contrast to the uplands, there is almost a marginalization of Brahmins in the lowlands, and they are not viewed as the dominant caste. This is something that has been noticed for a very long time through the centuries, and if you read colonial scholarship on the, Bra on the Punjab, they constantly refer to the fact that how strange it is that this is an area in which the Brahmins don't have such a high status. And it is a very fundamental question that has to be asked and gone into and answered. Um, initially, this might have been because of the gr a strong imprint of Buddhism, which has been practically almost wiped out in the Punjab. Nobody talks very much about Buddhism in the Punjab, but it was very much there, and um, this may be one aspect of that. Uh, clearly, Puranic Hinduism did not make a major impact in the lowlands, because there is an absence of the great temples that were built el elsewhere in the subcontinent, wherever Puranic Hinduism went to. We also do not have any very big, major, Shaiv or Vaishnav bhakti movements in the Punjab. In fact, the major bhakti movement, in a sense, partially, is with the coming of Guru Nanak. But before that, there is a tendency to borrow the ideas of the bhakti sons from other places. Did caste and religion impact each other? This is a question which has to be asked whenever one talks about religion in any part of the country. In the process of establishing Puranic Hinduism in the new areas, such as the hill states, the important question was, how were local groups assigned a Varna status? Obviously, when Brahmanism moves in and starts reorganizing society, as it's bound to do, at, the, at least at the elite levels, when the idea is introduced that the royalty has to be of the Kshatriya lineage, the priests have all to be Brahmins, how were the other Varna statuses worked out? This is something that historians haven't paid much attention to. Were the Varna categories introduced and allotted, right? You were doing this kind of job, so your Varna status will be such and such. Um, or was the existing hierarchy 
taken into the Varna system, and therefore, if you had a high status in the existing hierarchy, you were given a high status in the Varna system. Uh, this is a very important aspect of any area that is being changed, undergoing change from whatever religion it had earlier to uh, the coming of Puranic Hinduism. Was there a similar process going on in the plains, especially in the shadow of the foothills? Did the evolution of caste, and especially the emergence of upper castes, differ from the uplands to the lowlands? And a comparative study, therefore, of the two regions is extremely necessary. Now, I'm not pushing this as absolutely essential uh, for all purposes. What I'm trying to suggest is that you have similar backgrounds of peoples and pre-Brahmanic religions in these areas. How did they react to the coming in of the Brahmanic religion, and why was the reaction so very different? What were the local adaptations to the rules of caste, and who authorized these? Was the hierarchy of Varna flexible, and were Varna rules occasionally changed or overlooked in order to provide uh, whatever uh, recognition was required. We have a very interesting example from an inscription that was found in Pehova, not far away from here, uh, a big Shaivite temple of the second millennium belonging to the Ganga tradition. Uh, the inscription reads that uh, refers to Wealthy Brahman horse traders, literally horse traders, trading in horses. And the horse trade was horses coming from Central Asia with um, grain and textiles and stuff going, spices going from India to Central Asia. But the horses from Central Asia and Arabia were a standard item of trade right through Indian history. So you've got this inscription composed by wealthy Brahmins who are horse traders making donations to the local temple and to temples in various parts of the Ganga plain. So obviously they are extremely wealthy as a result of this trade. Um, the question then is, would the Dharma Shastras, with all their careful connotation of what makes a good Brahmin, have approved of Brahmins trading in horses? This is, I think, a question that needs to be asked. How did this get adjusted? And this is just one example, not just in the Punjab, but elsewhere too. You suddenly come across inscriptions where Brahmins and Kshatriyas and all the upper castes whose duties are carefully laid out in the Dharma Shastras are doing jobs where you say, good God, how are they doing these? What makes them lead the, to that, and how do, do these get accepted? So there is um, a, a, a great need to look at this kind of relationship. So then, apart from the Brahman horse traders, the, the more recognized trading castes began to come into importance as well, because remember that from the first millennium AD, uh, the early first millennium AD, when the Shakas and the Kushans and so on were in uh, this area, there was a tremendous boost of trade, especially with the Romans coming east and the Persians taking part in the trade as well. Then it dies down a little bit, but by about the first, second um, centuries of the second millennium, the Silk Road trade has really taken off, and the Indian middleman is playing a major role in conducting the trade from Central Asia to Iran. Uh, the Silk Road trade, by the way, is not a China-dominated trade, as it's often thought to be. It's like um, those of you that did embroidery in school, we used to have something called the chain stitch, where you make one stitch and then you jump up and you make another stitch and then you jump up and you make another stitch. And I refer to this Central Asian Silk Route trade as a chain stitch trade. Uh, 
The Chinese come along and they trade with the Uyghurs in the Gobi Desert. The Uyghurs take their goods, exchange goods with the Chinese, take the Chinese goods further west to the Sogdians. The Sogdians and the Uyghurs do a little exchange. The Sogdians then take it on to the Bactrians. The Bactrians do an exchange with the Indians and then take it on to the Iranians and so on. So it's, it's it good. And this is a time when that trade is really absolutely booming. That is from about the 8th to the 12th, 13th centuries AD. The preeminent trader in all of this is the caste that emerges as the Khatri. The Khatri works all the trade routes, um, and the trade is the central source of income. Um, there is obviously some competition going on amongst the upper castes, because if you've got Brahmins doing horse trading, you've obviously got Khatris also doing horse trading. So there's bound to be uh, a degree of competition. And the question is that was this kind of competition over trade limited to these areas, or does it extend further into the watershed and into the um, Ganges region? Khatris as traders were literate and familiar with accountancy, and therefore qualified to be employed as well in higher administration. So you have a linkage between administration and trade. And remember, of course, that administrators are in occupations that adjust very well to political change in any period of history. And their choice of religion, therefore, would be very influential. Now, if the Khatris are dominant in the lowlands, I'm not saying that this is the only reason why some religions came to the surface, but this is one factor that one has to consider. What was happening in the lowlands at this time, while Shamba is going on and these hill states are all going on supporting Puranic Hinduism, building temples and so on, what's going on in the lowlands? From about, about the 12th, 13th centuries onwards, you have two developments taking place, neither connected to Buddhism nor strongly correct connected to Puranic Hinduism. They're new developments. Uh, first of all, you've got in the Potohar Plateau the coming in of large groups of ascetics who call themselves Nath Panthis, Nath Jogis. Now, those of you that are familiar with a lot of Punjabi folk songs, folk songs of a religious kind, will immediately recognize the jogi. Um, song after song, main jogi de naal jana ya nahi jana? That's a very fundamental question that is constantly asked. So who are these jogis? These are the Nath Panthi Shaiva ascetics that come and settle in this Potohar Plateau. Um, in the south, in the Multan area, the confluence that I was talking about, in the 12th century, there arrives a new body of people known as the Sufis. Baba Farid, whom you might have heard of, turns up on the tw in the 12th century and sets up his khanka, uh, his hospice in the Multan area. And what is interesting about these Central Asian Sufis is that they come and settle in the Multan Satlij area and they take off in two directions. One is that they go up to Lahore. The other is that they cross the watershed and come to Delhi. And the famous Nizamuddin, Nizamuddin Aulia as he's sometimes called in Delhi, uh, is a disciple of Baba Farid. And so there's a nexus between this confluence area the watershed, and the Sufis in Delhi. Um, now, what happens with the question of um, uh, conversion? It's often said that the major conversions were done by the Sufis, and this is probably correct. Although the mythology, of course, is always that so-and-so went and invaded with his army, and he either killed 50,000 kafirs or he forced them to convert. And the figure is always 50,000. 
And no one's ever actually counted it, but it's, it's a normal figure, 50,000. Any one of these chronicles you go through. Actually, it is the Sufis who are doing the converting. But the important thing to remember is that the Sufis do not represent either Sunni Islam or Shia Islam. They represent a totally different kind of Islam which has its roots in Central Asia. The Sufi, the major Sufi um, uh, uh, tradition schools um, are uh, the Naqshbandi, the Chishti, and so on. They're all Central Asian. And those schools have a link with Persia, and sometimes later on they come from Persia and Central Asia. Now, um, the question then is, so when they convert, who do they convert? Uh, they convert in the Punjab, they convert some of the better known chiefships, the chiefs of pastoral clans, all this area, um, the, the Sin Sagar Doab, the Chinab, the Ravi Chinab Doab, and so on. These are all pastoral areas, they're not agricultural as yet. And so they're converting people like, um, you know, the, the um, local pastoral chiefs. Um, the Sials, the Bhattis, and so on, they get converted. And they get converted to a very flexible kind of Islam. It's so flexible that people have argued that the Sufis and the Nath Panthis were actually borrowing ideas from each other and organizations. So uh, that fluidity, I think, is, is something that one must always uh, keep in mind. Now, the, the, sorry, I'm just going, how much time do I have? 15 minutes? Okay. Um, so we, we, we find then that, um, let me go a little faster. The, the Nath Panthis, for example, um, cannot be included in the bracket of Hinduism. They are different. They're teaching a different kind of Hinduism. First of all, let me explain that I am very worried by this overall label of Hindu and Islam. One of the major characteristics of the Indian subcontinent vis-a-vis -vis religion is that every religion that rises here or comes here breaks up into a variety of sects. It not only breaks up, but very often different sects uh, 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 come and sort of stick on to other sects. And so this whole complex that we call Hinduism and Islam is actually a complex of a huge collection of small sects that have differing, differing relationships with each other. Some are very close to each other, some are very distant from each other. And if you look at the texts of the pre-colonial period, um, they don't describe themselves very often as being Hindu or being Muslim. They will describe themselves as belonging to a particular sect. And I think that that is something that we have to take, take into consideration uh, when we're, we're talking about these things. Um, they are therefore preaching not the formal religions of Hinduism and Islam. They're preaching something different. Uh, they're, they're preaching things like the major factor in both Sufism and the Nath Panthi religion. And to this, this extent, there is a commonality the major factor is the love for God, the love for the deity. Every kind of love is subsumed in this love, and this becomes a very major factor. I mean, you can be cynical about it, but you can also be very devotional about it. And why is there this love for the deity? Because supreme love for the deity finally leads to a completion of oneself, and that is what the Sufis are aiming at, that is what the Nath Panthis are also aiming at. And as you go through this literature, and at least the little bit that I went through, 
I couldn't help feeling that there's a kind of link with the Buddha saying what is really important is discovering yourself and finally going into the extermination of nirvana, which is self-completion. And so when one talks about religion and one talks about the disappearance of Buddhism in the Punjab or anywhere, I always feel that you really have to look at what followed and ask quite self-consciously, is there any link with what was happening before? There may not be. On the other hand, you may suddenly discover that there are some links, and those links are extremely important. Did the people of the lowland Doabs find the flexibility of the Sufi and the Nath Panthi teaching more attractive than the more rigidly regulated social and religious norms of both Puranic Hinduism and Quranic Islam. They are much more rigid, they're much more formal. And there is this huge sort of floating body of worshippers who want something more flexible and who are quite willing to worship at both places. You have Sufi Muslims coming and worshipping in the Nath Panthi centers, and you have Nath Panthi Hindus worshipping in the Sufi centers. It would seem then that by the 15th century, we have in the Punjab three simultaneous religious streams. Each is not individually watertight, but is differentiated and with fuzzy edges and overlapping edges. There's a lot of overlap that goes on between one Sufi silsila and another. And I think that, that is, these overlaps are extremely important and need to be looked at. We also have, in terms of division of regions, it would seem, and these are not watertight divisions. Please remember whatever I'm saying, I'm talking about essentials, I'm not talking about rigid, formal, watertight compartments. But we have Puranic Hinduism, very dominant in the Punjab, in the, in the hill states, the hill kingdoms, and the adjoining areas. We have the North, North Jogis, dominant in the northern lowlands, and the Sufis, especially the Chishti Sufis, in the southern Doabs. Was this then the context to the rise of the teachings of Guru Nanak? Uh, which gives it a slightly different orientation. Now, I'm not going into that because, as I said, I'm going to stop with my own period. The question that then comes up, um, two major questions, I think. Was Ganesh Das right in saying that the religions of the Punjab were the Hindu, the Muslim, and the Sikh? Or was he repeating what was being said by his new colonial masters? Because they were all bunching together religious sects into monolithic religions and giving them clear-cut labels. This is a serious question because it re relates to the diversity of the religions and the religions that people wish to follow and why they wish to follow them. But it also relates to the question of how we today view our religions of the past. What is our attitude to the history of religion? Do we accept these big, monolithic, closely tied bundles and simply talk about that? Or do we unwrap these bundles and take out whatever's in them and look at the contents much more clearly? Can these multiple groups rooted in religions that have undergone immense change over a historical period be collectively divided into three groups and labeled Hindu, Muslim, and Sikh? If we take the Punjab as defined by Ganesh Das, the region did not identify with a single religion. And I have tried to show that there were distinctive sub-regions supporting different religious beliefs. Nevertheless, the larger followings in these religions seem to have been from people that cut across 
all these so-called formal religions. They're not restricted to a single one. There were some even occasional continuities from earlier to later times. But maybe we haven't really searched for these continuities. We've assumed that when formal religion at the elite level changes, the entire population changes its religion. That is not so at all. The, in, the larger population is continually constructing a new religious articulation. And it's that that is important. Maybe we need to approach the study of religion from diverse perspectives, not just reading the texts or looking at the structures and monuments that were built by these people. If we look at cultural idioms, and I think that this is very important in the study of religion, uh, commonly used, a somewhat different picture does emerge. Let me give you one example that has puzzled me over the years. If we take the Punjabi language, which evolved in the second millennium AD and has a very extensive literature, Religious teachers of various kinds, of practically every kind, when they speak in Punjabi about their religion, will refer to God as Rab. Where does Rab come from? Which religious category does it belong to? It's not Puranic Hinduism, it's not Nath Panthi, it's not Buddhism, it's hardly Islam. So it's an interesting question. Why do they pick on this particular word? What is the origin and the history of this word? And how do they use it in the language? You would have to go through the whole Punjabi literature. Um, and for example, if you look at the Adi Granth, the number of times that Rab is referred to is really very impressive. And you have to answer that question, where did this come from? Many scholars up to now, now have done meticulous studies of the various religious texts composed and written and available to all. Maybe it is time now to turn to examining the link between religion and society by examining the environment of the region and its sub-regions and the people who inhabited it in order to understand what they meant when they talked about religious articulation. It's very important to, for historians particularly to ask this question of, we understand it this way, how did the people of that time understand it? It's a different question, it's a different attitude. And I think that you know we have so far missed out on it largely, we need to get to that attitude. How do we define a region? All right, we define religion by saying we have to look at cultural idioms and, and you know, re-look at the whole thing. How do we define a region? We have to keep in mind two things. One is that the geographical, geomorphological features of a region, which divides it into sub-regions, as I was trying to argue, the uplands, the upper doabs, the lower doabs, and so on, these sub-regions. These are relatively stable. Even you, you get, though you get the Sutlej going up and down and changing course, and you had the Hakra, which flowed south of the Sutlej and then suddenly disappeared into the desert and so on. Nevertheless, on the whole, these are reasonably stable features which continue throughout history and which therefore would play a role on religious articulations. The historical region, however, changes constantly. And there's a continual tug of war between that which is stable and that which is completely unstable. And by that I mean, you know, a period of 500 years of one group of people ruling is unstable because the next 500 years somebody else comes along. So that kind of stability that you get from geography and geomorphology that stability doesn't come from historical change. And what are we looking for when we talk about historical change? The activities of human society which are at the root of every historical change. 
There are political changes in the form of government. Why are there chief ships in some areas? Um, I didn't have time to mention that the watershed region between what is labeled Yamuna there, Roper and Satwij, in the Gupta period hosted a whole number of chief ships, that is people that didn't have kingdoms but had government by assembly, clan rule and, and, and that kind of thing. Uh, quite different from kingdoms, which were then conquered by Samudra Gupta, and then the whole thing came under kingdoms. Why is it that some regions have that system? Other regions from the start, from the word go, have kingdoms, like the hill states of the Punjab hills. And the other important aspect, of course, is the constantly changing borders that are marking territory. We think of borders as being eternal. There's nothing so changing, changeable as territorial borders. Every century, the borders of every kingdom change because the kingdoms change. So there's no sanctity about borders. Economic changes. Where is pastoralism predominant and why? It's predominant in the scrub regions and the deserts. Is it settled pastoralism? Is it nomadic pastoralism? One of the char characteristics of the Punjab is that in the Doabs, pastoralism is not nomadic. It is settled, which is why you get these families that rise, like the Bhattis and the Seals that I mentioned, who are chiefs of pastoral communities. Their wealth lies in herds, not in land. But there are others, the floodplains of the river, for example, which are cultivated, where the chiefs are land-owning chiefs, but that's much more limited until you get to the time of Feroz Shah Tughlaq, whose ruling in Delhi is a great admirer of the Sufis of Multan, comes to Multan and starts building canals all along the Sutlej, the lower Sutlej. And this area, for the first time, complements its wealth from trade with wealth from agriculture. And that marks a change. And it gives a certain kind of stability and continuity to the Sufi dargahs and khankas that are there and are being worshipped. Agriculture means the settlement of communities. It's less liable, obviously, to nomadism because land doesn't move. Animals move, but land doesn't move. So there is a difference between the two. And then you have the urban centers, which are based on trade. Urban centers are dependent not only on their own location, but on the people that they're trading with. So in the case of the Punjab, the trade pattern of the borderlands and Central Asia has an immediate impact on the trade in the Punjab. Because the trade of the Punjab, whether it's the Mauryan Highway up in the foothills or the southern route from Multan to, through the Bolan Pass, is dependent on the trade that is going on outside. And it's very important. Uh, what do all these changes mean? The produce on which societies are dependent will change from animals to uh, herds to items horses. Communications change. That, that's terribly important as societies change. When towns come up in urban centers and trade, the whole system of communications changes. The pastoralists are very local. The agriculturalists are a little less local. They have to take their produce to the market, so there's a little bit of coming and going there. The traders are right across the countryside. They're going all over the place. And one of the most interesting aspects of this is precisely that when we talk about the Central Asians, the Turks and, and, and the Mughals and so on coming in to India, and we talk about them as being alien and foreign, please remember that these are all people with whom North Indians, and particularly the people of the Punjab, have had trading relationships since the Mauryan period. Why is Ashoka Maurya putting up edicts right up beyond the map north? Who are these people he's talking to? He's talking to people with whom Indian traders are going up and down and having a very close relationship with. So 
That's very important when you talk about aliens and locals. You have to ask yourself the question, are they really alien? Do we know nothing about them? Or are they somehow tied into our history, which is the whole basis of talking about shared histories? I mean, you know, on that side of the border, they're talking about India, the Punjab is the frontier. The Punjab is talking about the borderlands as the frontier. Is there a frontier? Is there, in fact, a complete distinction between the two? It's a question worth asking. And then there is social change. Who are the dominant groups? Why is there a difference between the dominant Brahman in the hill kingdoms and the dominant Khatri in the lowlands and the trading areas? Terribly important to regional consciousness. Um, and I like to think as a good Khatri that the Punjabi consciousness is a Khatri consciousness, <laughs> preeminently. Uh, religious change. When patronage changes, then religion also changes. As long as you have the royalty paying you large sums of money, you can do what you like, you can put up the institutions you like, you can put up huge temples and mosques and all the rest of it. When that patronage declines and the wealthy patronage of the traders becomes a little less, your actions have to be controlled. And when that patronage also declines, and it's the people who are following you with very little money but great faith, then the nature of religion also has to change. So let me say finally that I think um, looking at religion and region in terms of the kinds of pasts that people share, we in the Punjab have we're really on the edge of this historical research, and we have a great future in front of us. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Thapar. I do apologize for the time that we've lost because of the electricity situation, but it's all under control now. Uh, we have time for two questions, uh, so any of you who have your questions may raise them now. Um, or you may write them down in your notebooks. We have a session uh, post-lunch, which is called the World Cafe, which allows time for deeper discussions and uh, engagement. So if you have any questions now, we have time for two. Yes, I'm going to give you the mic. Yeah. You can tell us your name. My name is Raman Man. Uh, I'm a, an independent documentary filmmaker. But uh, my question relates to your, uh, your observation that uh, the Brahmins uh, afforded uh, a sense of lineage or provided a lineage to the rulers of the day. And uh, along with it, uh, would you say they also provided legitimacy to, to the rules that the different rulers made and how it suited them. The, the desire for lineage, and especially if you can link that lineage to the Puranic lineages, which you do if you claim to be Surya Vamsh or Chandra Vamsh, you're automatically linked to the lineages of the earliest uh, uh, Bharatvarsh. Uh, the moment you do that, you get legitimized. You, get you not only get caste status, you're a regular Kshatriya, but you get legitimized. It is your right to rule because you have the right connections. But would you say that's the beginning of the mixing of politics and religion? I think politics and religion have always been mixed. But it's a question of mixing them further to a further degree. To what degree do you mix them? Yes, this is an aspect of mixing po politics and religion, yeah. Anybody else? Uh, hi, doctor. My name is Navleen. And uh, my question is, how do we bring into deeper consciousness that what we think uh, is our religion, the so-called, the, the monolithic 
organized religious that we have been put into is um, nothing but a colonial construct and we indeed as uh, you know, Puranic people or ancient people were uh, more flexible and more fluid with uh, what we believed in and uh, how we uh, interacted with other people who believed in something else, perhaps. So how do we bring this into, uh, you know, a, a, a local consciousness or a deeper consciousness of people of today? I think the difference is not so much of time. It's not that uh, we, we moderns do think much more in rigid frameworks than perhaps the people of the past. It's, um, it's also a question of which social strata are you talking about. There is a tendency, and I deliberately use the word tendency, for those that belong to elite groups kingship, aristocracy, court circles, higher administration, and so on, they tend to conform much more to formal religions because they have to declare themselves to be this or that or the other so that the religion tends to get however flexible the religion may be. And Buddhism is a lovely example of that, that it begins in a very flexible way and then slowly and gradually gets frozen. Um, how, when, when that happens, your, your, uh, the, the groups in authority begin to formalize the religion. But the point is that if you look at the religion of the majority in these societies, uh, it's much more flexible. It crosses many borders. I mean, uh, you, you take somebody like uh, Hingalaj Mata, for example, who's a very famous deity of Western India, was pre-partition, still is. Uh, she has a shrine near Karachi. Who are the people that go there to worship? Umpteen Hindus and Muslims. The Muslims call her Bibi, the Hindus call her Mata, but they're all there together worshiping. Now, that to me is a much more important aspect of the link between religion and society and the potentiality that it holds, both for religion and for the way in which society develops, than just the limited religion of the few people in authority. And how do we get to that? We get to that by looking at sources other than the ones that we have been hemmed in by up till now. We move from the texts to the oral tradition, and we start asking communities what their prayers and their songs and their mythology was in the oral tradition. You start looking at the objects that they worship. Um, not simply in, how should I describe it, fashionable social terms of ethnic religion. No. You look at it as the reality of the religion of the community that's doing that worship. What does it mean to them? Why do they choose these symbols? Why do they choose these particular deities that have nothing to do with Hinduism or Islam or any, any other religion? They're quite separate. Why do they choose them? What does it mean to them? What is their relationship with something beyond them which they call religion? And then I think one begins to understand much more clearly not only what was the religion of the larger population at that time, but even aspects of the formal religion. Because remember that whatever is observed by those in authority is not cut off from their supporters. So if you have a following that says, no, I don't quite believe in this deity, I prefer that, there's a tendency for authority to say, well, we have to carry them along with us, so we'll also incorporate them. And the history of uh, Puranic Hinduism is an absolutely magnificent history of incorporation. Every time there was a problem, they incorporated the deity. It became part of Hinduism. It's a very nice way of doing it. So it's, it's like a conversion, really. You don't go through the formality of a conversion. You simply incorporate the, the object of worship, the people who are conducting the worship, and the people who are worshiping. Sorry, 
I have a follow-up question. So we talk of religion, but we, do we also know about factions of people who lived without religion? We should know, because there are enough of them. <laughs> we should know. Uh, people that either live without religion or who have doubts. And very often it is those doubts that lead to another sect coming up. I mean, after all, Buddhism and Jainism started with doubt. They doubted the Vedic Brahmanical tradition and therefore started thinking differently. So yes, you have to consider those that are supposedly without religion and try and understand why they are without religion.